Hi, I'm Susan Matthews. Welcome to the Subverse, where we journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from the complexity of development to the art of resistance, from colonial histories that haunt us to reimagining our futures. In this episode, we speak with Jasha Benin about her very recently published book, Brutal Beauty: Aesthetics and Aspiration in Urban India. Jisha is associate professor of theater and performance studies at Stanford University. The book which is simply fascinating uses performance studies and turns to artworks ranging from visual art installations and photography to documentary film theater and live performances to argue that neoliberalism is not just an economic social and political phenomenon it is also a profoundly aesthetic project remaking not just cities but citizens i enjoyed this conversation so much and the fact that this episode allowed me to connect to a school friend after 25 odd years made it even better speaking about the city we grew up in bangalore and where much of her book takes shape it was very personal Hi Jisha, welcome to the Subverse. Thank you for joining us. Hi Susan, it's great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We want to start the interview with knowing a little bit more about your own background and how you came to performance studies and what planted the seed for this wonderful new book that you've written. Thank you so much, Susan. So I I was an English major in college and then I went on to JNU where I did my MA in English literature as well and you know I was very active in the theater scene in Bangalore growing up and in Delhi and so I wanted to study drama but in a way that incorporated embodiment and so not just as a textual genre but also as an embodied genre so I started a PhD in drama at Stanford which was subsequently the department called itself performance study so it's a sort of move in the field itself where we are looking more centrally at theater as it is performed but performance studies is a really rich and capacious field which also sort of works at the intersection of anthropology and performance so it is trying to break out of the kind of proscenium stage theater looking at a variety of events as performance including rituals and ceremonies and performance art so the field itself is so broad that it invites a range of cultural texts that you can imagine and you can study it as kinetic and as embodied so it allows for a much greater range it also draws a little bit on performative speech act theory so the book itself is situated within this field and allows me to look at a whole range of texts including visual art and installation and theater of course if you could start by sort of telling us what inspired the name brutal beauty and also when you start the book you talk about a particular sculpture which is called stopover So maybe if you could speak about both things thank you. So I wanted to think about the way in which aesthetics are mobilized in discourses of city planning in Bangalore and in other sort of urbanizing cities in the global south. I also at the same time wanted to push back against some typically romantic ideas about what aesthetics can do how it is often liberatory and how it's a site of resistance. we have very very romantic ideas about the arts as panacea to kind of social ills and i wanted to complicate that picture a little bit to think also about how discourses of aesthetics and beauty are mobilized there's been some extraordinary work done by janaki nair who's written about the way in which beauty becomes a category that is invoked in these city planning projects and asha gertner is another anthropologist who's written about aesthetic governmentality so i'm drawing on the work of some of these historians and anthropologists to think about how beauty becomes this category that's mobilized towards very anti-democratic ends so you do see in a city like bangalore urban informal settlements just being raised to the ground because it's unsightly and you want to create 
maybe a shopping mall or glass and chrome high rises. These are typical templated features of a world class city. And so you find these informal settlements are just kind of demolished in order to create these new kinds of imagined world class city sites. And of course, the people are also imagined as unesthetic, right? Like you want to get rid of all those folks on the pavements who are selling fruits and the fruit vendors and all of those in these projects where you're widening the roads, you're also decimating the tree cover. So all of these are highly anti-democratic projects that are sometimes undertaken in the name of aesthetics. So that's where the title Brutal Beauty comes from. It has a sort of resonance with these urban planning projects. But at the same time, I also wanted to look at urban subjects, like what's going on with the citizens. It's not just the city that's being renovated. Even the citizens are being remade in some way. And you have these new regimes of work that are pretty much sort of encouraging workers and laborers to work 24-7 and constantly upgrade their human capital human capital being a concept that Chicago economists were putting together and has been taken up by theorists like Foucault and Wendy Brown to think about how we're constantly at work trying to improve our portfolio value and enhance ourselves. And this kind of relentless project of self-enhancement takes its own toll, right? It results in burnout, in depression, in just exhaustion. So what are the brutal dimensions of these projects of self-enhancement. So it's telling a kind of double story where we're looking at the city as well as the citizens and looking at the cost that this kind of pursuit of beauty or perfection and where we end up in this kind of pursuit. I start with the image of Sheila Gauda and Christoph Storz's stopover because to me that's a really extremely beautiful image. And of course, those stones are grinding stones that used to be housed within homes where people would crush and grind spices. And they were unearthed and discarded when real estate developers were building new homes that were more modern. And now you have all these very brisk and efficient kitchen appliances making these objects obsolete and redundant. At the same time that real estate developers were a little bit anxious about just destroying these objects because they seemed so charged that they kind of had this sacral aura that prohibited them from just destroying it. So they just were discarded. And the artists, Sheila Gauda and Christoph Storz, collected these and created an installation around them. And I thought they really very beautifully evoke this sense of contradictoriness that I'm trying to get to at the heart of the book itself, that on the one hand, you have the sense of you want to move to something that's more efficient, but at the same time, there's a reluctance to destroy this kind of charged object, which exudes a kind of aura. So I thought that that sense of affective contradictoriness allowed me to return to my own work that I was doing when I had first started this project, which was the production I did with actors, which was an adaptation of The Cherry Orchard. We called it The City of Gardens. But in that production, we were also trying to capture some of this urban transformation and what happens when these cities are renovated and remade and what happens to the people who are in the city, how a certain folks rendered kind of obsolete and we have a certain nostalgia about the passing of this older genteel kind of life at the same time that you have the emergence of a new kind of entrepreneurial actor, a new kind of enterprising subject. So to capture some of that sense of doubleness and contradictoriness, I thought this would be a great opening. Thank you, Jisha. And when did uh, you do the play in Bangalore? That was in 2008. Yeah, so we did the production in 2008, and uh, we we did it both at Ranga Shankara, and then we also did it at Grasshopper in Banargata. So definitely this whole project, when I was directing Cherry Orchard, the adaptation City of Gardens, it emerged from my own longing for my city because I had been away for so long. And I was sick. And so I, you know, when you're sick, of course, you're yearning for home. And so 
when I was in California and convalescing, really, I had this, I dreamed up this project that I would go back home and direct this show about my city. And so there was a different kind of nostalgia that I, I was hoping would show up. And of course, when I work with actors, and it was a device production, which meant that you ask the actors for their own input. And so we're all kind of creating this work together. It's not like a directorial vision. It's created collaboratively with actors as your co-creators. So my actors were very feisty and they were really talented and opinionated and they challenged me <laughs> and many of them were new migrants to the city and they were like we're so done with your nostalgia because you're constantly positioning us as if we were outsiders so all of those sorts of encounters some of which really were very revealing to me I found a way to incorporate it into the production so that it wouldn't just be a kind of NRI's nostalgia for her home city, it would have some of that tension and friction that my actors were bringing into it that complicated that nostalgia. So, Jisha, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the structure of your book, because you've got five chapters, and they all deal with, with different things. Sure. So, when I was thinking about the book, one of the things that I wanted to push back against was the way in which urban studies often sort of centers its questions around debates around planning and policy. And I wanted to introduce the question of aesthetics into it and think about how aesthetics complicates our understandings of urban studies. So the book's layout or structure starts with thinking about property and real estate and the many conflicts around spatial struggles that you see manifest in the city that's urbanizing. So the first chapter looks at urban panic around questions of development and property and uh, demolition of informal settlements and the emergence of these insulated, gated communities. And then I move from there to looking at call center industry as one exemplary site where you can see the emergence of these enterprising, entrepreneurial, young citizens in the city. And so we look at a range of performances around the call center and how it allows us to think about aspiration as a particularly kind of middle class striving. And then we move to looking at different kinds of urban subjects and looking at queer and same-sex desire as another kind of cosmopolitan horizon of self-making. And then it turns to the work of Pushpamala, and I'm particularly interested in looking at narcissism in that context and also kind of rethinking narcissism. Instead of thinking about it only as self-absorption, I want to use her work to think about what it might mean to disperse the self into the city, the environs, which I think she does very well. So it looks at it, narcissism in the context of this obsessive curation and presentation of the self in social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And all the sort of incitements to self-reliance that you hear in public discourses in neoliberalism is kind of a critique of that using her work. And then the final chapter looks at waste. I look specifically at electronic waste as well, and thinking about how these artistic engagements with obsolete objects can also be extended to thinking more broadly about obsolescence and what kinds of people become obsolete in this imaginary that is constantly obsessed with the new and with innovation and novelty, etc. So that's the kind of arc of the book is that each chapter takes up questions about beautification and what the kind of dark side of those projects might be. We'll be back after a short break. Thank you, Jisha. Loved all the chapters. Really, really enjoyed it. And as we discussed before the podcast, it's a pity that we don't have enough time to cover each of those chapters. 
So what I would like to do is focus on chapter one and chapter five. And the first one, as you mentioned, is about property and real estate. Let's say the dark side of, of aspirations in this regard. So I'd like to speak maybe a little bit more about this and some of the artwork that you talk about in this particular chapter. Yeah, so that chapter is, like you said, it looks at all of these sorts of building projects. I mean, anyone who lands up in Bangalore, I think their, one of their first comments will be just look at the mess of <laughs> in the city because there are just so many building projects all over, whether it's construction of houses or de demolition of houses or roads. The whole kind of frenzy of development is manifest in all of these construction projects that, you're, that are just, it's manifest across the city. It's hard to miss. And of course, it raises a lot of themes around this kind of unbridled world-class city-making project. You have to contend with the sort of increasing insulation of these elite communities, of gated communities. And then what David Harvey describes in relation to the informal settlements and the kind of active economies of dispossession that we see in relation to these kinds of evictions that are also ongoing and then the usurpation and remaking of dead capital of rural hinterlands that are kind of incorporated into the city that's constantly expanding and made into the high value liquid capital of speculative property. So you see all of these sorts of spatial struggles that are going on in the city and many competing claims to the city. And of course, artists, the ones I work with, who I think are really, really brilliant and so politically conscious, they're offering and articulating critiques and alternative imaginaries of the city. So one artist, I, I start the chapter with Sureka's work, and she herself comes from a farming community and her family has been displaced from their farm. So this work and her work, which deals a lot with questions of environment and gender, has a particular resonance for her, of course. And this particular piece of hers that I start the chapter with is called They Had Their Home Here, which is a photo series. And it was created in 2008, 2009. And in each photographic composition, Sureka will superimpose a very clinical, precise line drawing image against a photograph of a very kind of frantic scene of eviction. So that kind of juxtaposition I find really interesting because on the one hand, you have very, you can see the kind of scene where you have the evicted kind of sitting listlessly on the rubble, this kind of smoking concrete, and then this kind of clean, precise line drawing that she superimposes on them, which again kind of evokes a whole range of unruly feelings with the notion that here these emergent aspirational homes in the metropolis are literally constructed on the grounds of these you know demolished homes of the informal settlements so there's definitely a kind of foreboding and sense of panic that she's trying to capture in these photographs and juxtaposing the kind of sterile standardized pattern and non-fungible homes of the evicted against these very precise and clinical images. So you can see that that kind of juxtaposition is at play between the kind of promise of the aspirational home and the despair of the people who've just been evicted. Another artist who does really interesting work around real estate is Krishnarad Chonath. And his is the opposite end of the spectrum because his image that I'm dealing with, his installation is called Private Sky. And here he's kind of trying to capture the absurdity of the attempt of gated communities to try to insulate themselves from the messy materiality of the city. And I was talking to him and he said the idea for this project came because he was sitting outside one of these homes that were being remade into a gated community. And he said it was the area was infested with mosquitoes. So what do you do? You're going to create this gated communities, but what are you going to do to rid it of the mosquitoes? That non-human element is going to undo these attempts to kind of insulate yourself from the third world or whatever that attempt is. So his work is really also very beautiful. It's a installation of a white palatial bungalow with a two-car garage and the bungalows perched 
on top of a leafless dead tree. And the tree itself is held within a white pot. So the tree that holds the bungalow itself doesn't have any space to grow and is being choked. So you can see that there's a whole commentary on how development is kind of choking the life of the environment. And the tree cover is suffering as a result of the constant frenzied development and construction project. So there's a whole kind of interesting commentary there. Of course, as we know, Bangalore was once called Garden City for its beautiful flowering trees, but we've seen incredible amounts of deforestation in this kind of development frenzy. And so that the whole installation is very, very white, and its whiteness is both this kind of aspiration for a kind of pristine purity, but also very ghostly. At least it has that effect. <laughs> There's something almost unreal or surreal about that kind of unsullied whiteness that suggests a kind of deathly beauty that draws on the ghosted manual labor, the depleted natural soil to erect this kind of otherworldly pallid installation. And of course, that figure of the mosquito, which is the only black object in this installation, is of course a reminder that no amount of insulation is going to prevent you from the deathly sting of the mosquito. And the installation itself is housed in a room with really high mirrors so that the audience person or the viewer, when they enter into the space, you find yourself replicated so that you yourself then become this kind of standardized, replicated figure who is aspiring to own one of these bungalows that's sitting atop a leafless tree. So it's overall a kind of surreal and produces some kind of uneasiness as you look at this image, which is absolutely beautiful, but also creates some kind of anxiety in the viewer. So those are some examples of work that's being done that critiques these unbridled city-making construction projects that you've seen just all over Bangalore. I also love the title Private Sky. I think that sort of sums it yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Because all the commons are now being parceled out and privatized. So yeah, very kind of cheeky title. <laughs> Thank you, Jisha. In fact, you really described the artwork so beautifully in this chapter. And I also loved the, the sculpture called Home. And I'd be curious if you can just speak a little bit about that one, because it just the description was really very evocative. Thank you. So that is Shantamani's work. And I also love her work. She's also a very political and astute kind of artist. And this piece was done in the wake of the Babri Masjid demolition and its reverberation in Bangalore. Um, and this piece emerged when she encountered in her travels through Bangalore City, a woman who was pregnant and her home had been incinerated and she created this piece out of charcoal so that the, you know, the material that she uses is, is itself really important because charcoal itself has all of those connotations around environment, but also it's fragile. So it's, she creates this culture of a pregnant woman and it's evocative of the woman that she met during the, in the wake of the Babri Masjid demolition. And here you have a figure that's pregnant with life at the same time that the home is charred down and burnt down. So there is that sense of doubleness in that image itself. It's at once home to an unborn baby, her womb, but at the same time, what home? Now this figure is charred. So that both the yearning for life and the impossibility of life is captured in that figure. And that, of course, takes us to a different dimension around questions of urbanism is the way in which the religious right in India has kind of reshaped the cities we've grown up in with these new authoritarian and highly divisive programs and agendas that have completely marginalized and terrified so many populations. So panic takes on a whole different resonance for marginalized communities and dispossessed communities. I agree. I think you're speaking about artwork, which may have been done a few years ago and talking about maybe an earlier time or an earlier event, but it's scary how 
relevant it is for the times that we live in. So now, Jisha, let's go to the last chapter. So we've dealt with precarity and panic. And now I want to speak about the chapter that you've written on waste, which for me was just a real eye-opener. I think definitely when you spoke about waste and e-waste, I mean, these are things that we know about and we know about the lives of waste pickers, etc. But I think the way you sort of talked about trash and waste and also how we then render humans as waste and treat humans as trash. I found the way that you combined both things together to be really, really interesting. If you could speak about this chapter, thank you. Sure. So that chapter, when you're writing about contemporary capitalism, neoliberal urbanism, you're of course talking about the emergence of all these new commodities in, that people now want to buy. And it, contemporary capitalism constantly enjoins us to consume. And the pleasure sometimes lies in desiring the commodity. Almost as soon as you acquire it, it loses its appeal and it ends up in a trash can. Otherwise, sometimes obsolescence is just built into the commodity itself, like your cell phone or your computer, which after a while, if you don't have certain apps, that you need to download your phone itself becomes obsolete. So it's planned into the object. So even if you would like to hold on to that phone, it's now no longer functioning with the new updated app. So you have to discard it. So you're forced into certain kinds of patterns of discarding objects because that obsolescence is built into the gadgets. Trash is just the other side of commodity capitalism and economic liberalization has just vastly increase the just the sheer volume of commodities and the waste that's generated. And the book that really stunned me was Asa Doran and Robin Jeffrey's Waste of a Nation, where they detail this out in India. And it's a really stunning book. It's one of the most sobering books I've read recently. And they write about how the average American creates about 150 times more waste than a year than an average Indian. The US produces about 250 million metric tons of waste per year. India generates about 65 million tons. So of course you have to contend with the sheer volume of waste and then think about, well, who are the people who are actually dismantling this waste? The waste pickers or India's informal economy process more than 95% of this electronic waste in particular. And when they do that, when they dismantle it and process it, they're not wearing gloves, they're not in sterile conditions. So obviously it impacts their health and it damages them. Of course, these are people we don't even care about. So it doesn't, there is very little effort in trying to think about how we could ensure safety of the people who are the waste pickers. So there's a way in which the category of waste then just extends beyond the waste that we're generating to the people who we associate with this waste. They exist on a kind of continuum and they become associated with the waste that they're picking up, right? They themselves become waste. And these are some of the most precarious people in India. They are constantly navigating social discrimination, poor sanitation, bad health, hazardous conditions. So they're literally the bottom of the society. And often they are Dalits or they are marginalized Muslim communities. And so it it has all these other connotations of caste and religion associated with it. It's linked to ritual pollution. So you're constantly blurring the boundary between the waste picker and the waste that they're picking. And so it just re-entrenches social inequality and consolidates our casteist ideas about which lives are valued within the country. Because this chapter is also kind of transnational in scope, it's looking at the travel of electronic discarded objects from Europe and US to Asia, which is called the dustbin of pollution, really. So we're thinking also about transnationally whose lives are imagined as most disposable. So we think not only about the ways in which human beings are making waste, but the ways in which waste 
creates a category of the human being because these are the people who are allowed to be associated with waste. They're less than human people. We'll be back after a short break. In this chapter, you talk about quite a few different artworks and also some films, and they're all wonderful. So maybe we could start with the first one, which is the film, which is about the waste picker. And then maybe we can also talk about some of the other films that are mentioned at the end, done by Sureka. So the film I start with is a short film made by Vivan Sundaram on Marianne Hussein, who is someone who is a waste picker and works with the NGO Chintan that Vivan Sundaram is also working with. And it's a really beautiful film. So you can see this boy sort of emerge from trash and then just sort of has this kind of superhero kind of gestos or gesture, and then he gets incorporated back into trash. And that kind of allows us both to see his emergence and his overcoming of the trash that he's enmeshed in, but also then the reincorporation of it. So it offers both reprieve, but also then it gets reabsorbed back into the trash. So it's both disconcerting, but also maybe you could say there might be something hopeful in it. The other work that Vivan Sundaram does, and he's done extraordinary work around waste and questions of waste, is 12-bed ward, which is another very haunting, sterile kind of image of these beds that he places just the soles of footwear on. And then the installation allows you to kind of see just the bare soles of these various shoes that recyclers are now going to rework into new shoes. And again, There's been a lot of fabulous work that looks at some of these ideas. Vinay Gidwani has done really excellent work around what this work of recycling might actually look like if you're trying to remove the soles from the shoes and these recycling economies. So that's another really beautiful work that allows us to kind of take a look at the work that is involved in it, the kind of toll it takes on one's health the toxic fumes that are released in these processes and allows you to see just the damaging effects of some of these. Absolutely. I love the 12-bed ward. I mean, it, it's so stark and you also have a picture of it in the book and it really, it's very striking. The other artist you also mention in this particular chapter is Chonath and I think the piece is called My Hands Smell of You and I think that one is particularly on e-waste, so it's very interesting. So that piece is another, you know, Chonats. Again, the title is so My Hand Smell of You. It almost sounds romantic or erotic. But of course, he's talking about electronic waste and how your electronic waste that I have been trying to disassemble and recycle, the smell of that toxic waste has now seeped into my skin. So my hand smell of you. So there's a whole different, it's almost an accusation. It's not a romantic title at all. And the work itself is gorgeous because he has this kind of chandelier that is composed of electronic objects that dangles over a kind of red bed of sandalwood. And it almost looks like a matrimonial bed. Again, kind of erotic charge, but this accusation that hovers around it that basically is responsible for killing me. And there's a second version of the same piece that he does at Pompidou where he exchanges, he asks the viewer to bring any obsolete electronic item to him and he would take that and exchange, he would give them a bar of sandalwood soap, which is very typical of Bangalore, a typical gift that you would give someone from our city. And the sculpture itself, one wall has all these objects of discarded e-waste And you walk around the wall and on the other side is a beautiful golden orange uh, pattern of just burnished sandalwood that's mounted on the wall. So again, it's a kind of doubled image. On the one hand, you have the brutality of economic liberalization and electronic waste. And on the other hand, you have this kind of beautiful gift that he's giving that's life-giving. Sandalwood, again, sort of is resonant 
and its evocation of healing properties and all of that. So that's another really beautiful piece that looks at changing this economy into one where you're accepting somebody's toxic object and in turn giving someone the gift of healing and beauty. Jusha, so there are a couple of other films also in this chapter, which I find really interesting. And those were done by Sureka. And again, really, it speaks to kind of Bangalore and the city and its parks. I would love to hear about it from you. Yeah, so, you know, Sureka, I'll talk about the two park films, for instance. Bangalore, as you know, at one point was contemplating having IDs for people who would use parks. And of course, that would mean a whole range of people who would never be able to access these parks, which means even parks were now, you were going to police who would go into parks and who would be allowed to go into parks. And so I think Sureka's taking up some of these kinds of issues that are emerging in the city that are policing and being very anti-democratic towards poorer people in the city who often sleep in parks and it's they rest in parks. So there's the film that she makes about the beggar woman Padma who suddenly disappears from the park and there's a lot of, it's a very agitated film because there's a certain kind of quality of foreboding and anxiety because you don't really know what happens to this woman who had used the park as her home for so long and then she's evicted from it. There's no sense of what happens to her. And it's juxtaposed with this other film about the laughing citizens, the elderly who show up in the park and they are part of a laughing club, which is to say they go there, they're lonely elderly people who feel a little bit obsolete themselves, right? Now, these are all the kind of casualties of economic liberalization, the collateral casualties. So they're kind of feeling left out and abandoned and they go to these parks for community but also just to get out of their homes and just laugh to get over whatever anxiety or depression they might be having and so that was also really interesting to me because it reinforces this whole notion that we are expected to just constantly be happy and we are constantly being encouraged to perform our happiness so this is all part of that corporate workplace culture where you have this notion of toxic positivity, where you are, happiness gives you a kind of work advantage. You're not allowed to express the full range of human emotions. You're just constantly performing happiness. So you can see how those ideas infiltrate into the laughing clubs where people feel like, okay, we are there's a certain obligation to be happy. You see some of her films are capturing that. She also has work on electronic waste and resource, and she's done installations around it. So I find Sureka is really such an interesting artist, and she's done a whole range of works around these kinds of issues. Thank you, Jisha. In fact, I have to say that when I first decided that we would have this conversation and I wanted to read the book, I was really curious to see how you would be able to deal with kind of neoliberalism and capitalism using performance studies. But by the end of the book, I am completely convinced that this really offers, I think, a window into these subjects that I had never really explored before. And I have worked on development and these issues for the last 20 uh, odd years. But I feel like I have really learned something new through this and also been introduced to these amazing artists, many of them whom I have not really been acquainted before, but no longer strangers after this book. There are incredible artists in Bangalore. And I think one of the most special things about Bangalore is that they're so collaborative. There are so many artists co-ops. That's the culture of artists in the city. So you don't find the kind of competitive ethos as much. That's not to say it doesn't exist, but the whole energy is much more about how they support each other. So they often will do artist talks where other artists will come give feedback. So the co-op culture in among arts community in Bangalore is extremely lovely. And many of them are students of Ken School of Art and Hadapad, who is one of the former mentors of many of them. He also instilled that ethos of a kind of collaborative and cooperative ethic amongst artists, which is which moves them away from a different kind of energy that animates artists in other cities, even in India. So I have to say it's a very unique set of artists. Their work is very 
political. If there's a kind of urgency to their work. It, they don't wear it on their sleeve. It's subtle. So I really find it very poignant and powerful, the work, work they do. Exactly. And you mentioned this in your epilogue when you speak about receptivity and responsibility. And, and I think each of the artists that you talk about, they seem to embody both these aspects in their work. This was also a kind of response to a way in which art scholars are often thinking and writing about art in a way that insulates art from the kind of messy political, social, economic environments that artworks are made in. So it was this was certainly not the case in any of the artists that I was looking at. They're all deeply engaged civic subjects, right? They're deeply concerned. And their work is animated by the materials and the issues that they see unfolding around them. So to me, it was very artificial to say, well, you know, you shouldn't be discussing social, political, economic issues. The whole kind of art for art's sake thing met its limits for me. And so I was very much interested in looking at how these artists are in a kind of dialectical relationship around receptivity and responsibility. They both are receptive to the transformations, urban civic transformations in the city, and they feel a sense of responsibility to speak up and to critique and to engage with those transformations. And you see much more exciting things that the artists are doing, which is that they are engaging with the environment. They're not thinking of themselves as insulated or autonomous artists in some sort of elitist way. They are urban subjects, they're civic subjects, and they find ways of talking back through their artwork. So it's a much more dynamic, porous relationship that they have with the city space and the urban transformations. And I really wanted to acknowledge and celebrate their spirit. Jisha, I'd like to wrap up the conversation by asking you about your next project or projects, what you have in store, and also anything that you would want to say to the listeners before we sign off. So right now, I, it's a very tentative third project that I've started to think about, and I'm interested in looking at the relationship between performance and law. I'm very interested in the many acting strategies and performance cultures that are activated in around questions of confession, for instance, and notions of performance, both on the witness stand or in the courtroom. So there's a whole kind of story to be told around the relationship between law and performance that I'm kind of starting to get really interested in, in you know, thinking about how personhood gets determined in these legal contexts, because we know that in law, personhood is a very large term, right? A corporation can be a person, even a river can be a person. And then some persons have been denied personhood, right? So to really think about what does personhood mean in the legal context, how is it performed? How do you need to go back into some of these notions of performing contrition, performing remorse in order for you to get a break or not be charged with some crimes, etc. So those are some questions that I'm trying to bring law and performance studies into conversation with each other. So that's the third project. Fascinating. I definitely did not expect that. But I agree, we must have a conversation about this. And there are definitely a couple of lawyers I will put you in touch with, I think would be very interesting for this project. Great. I would love that because I think there's a lot to be said. And it's just a very exciting, I think, intersection that we can mine a lot more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jisha, for joining us. Thank you, Susan. It was a pleasure and hope to see you soon in person. Thanks to Jisha Menon for sharing her thoughts with us. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice and culture. We have more information about all our guests and their work in the episode show notes on darkandlight.com. One programming note is that given some holidays that are coming up, we will release our next episode on the 18th of November, and that will be our last episode of this first season. You can follow us on Instagram at darkandlightzine. 
If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. So long and thanks for listening.